During the late 20s, hydraulic placer mining was tried on Moose Creek and Eureka Creek. $90,000 was spent on two hydraulic projects. For one of the projects, a 12,000 foot long ditch, six feet wide and two feet deep, was built from Wonder Lake to the mining site to obtain water. The projects were soon abandoned because gold recovery was below expectations. Eureka, located at the foot of Quigley Ridge, was a summer mining camp for most of the miners. They would move north to Glacier in the winter where the timber and big game were in abundance. One of Glacier's most prominent residents and property owners was Polly LeBeau. She was the first and only woman to cross the Alaska Range over Muldroon Glacier. She came in 1918 and acquired several mining camps and was known to be quite a wrestler. Two visitors to Glacier were Miss Lindstrow and Miss Ryan. They are seen here with Joe Dalton. Party time at Glacier City. Attending was Joe Quigley, Joe Sway, Miss Lindstrom, Miss Ryan, and Nels Henderson, whom for years hauled supplies used in Kantishna from Fairbanks with a gas boat. He is seen here with his partner, Walter Ames, at Square Deal with Henderson's boat and leaving the docks at Ninana. For many years to come, the Kantishna River would be used as a transportation route in and out of the Kantishna Hills. Passengers traveling on boat up and down the Kantishna River encountered Athabascan Indian fish camps along the banks. Fish wheels used to catch salmon could be seen turning in the river. The Athabascans cut, smoked, and dried the fish for year-round use. Occasional glimpses of Mount McKinley could be seen in the distance, and a few Athabascan Indian villages were passed as boats went up and down the Kantishna River. Most of the miners spent their winter farther north. The Quigleys lived year-round on Quigley Ridge. The ridge was above timberline, so there was a great amount of drifting snow because of the lack of shelter from wind. Dog teams were the only source of transportation in winter, and people all over Alaska used dogs to do their work. Both Fanny and Joe were mushers. Because their home was above timberline, there was no source of firewood nearby. Firewood had to be hauled by dog team from as much as 20 miles away. Fanny did a lot of other jobs that men do, such as sawing firewood and trapping. Both Fanny and Joe were very good hunters. A subsistence hunting ethic evolved among the permanent residents of the Kantishna area, and some market hunting was done to keep the mining camp supplied. A well-known story about Fanny was that she was moose hunting on high country without shelter, and it started to get dark by the time she spotted a moose. Fanny killed the moose with one shot, gutted it, and solved the problem of where to spend the night by crawling inside the warm carcass. The carcass froze while she slept, and she had, in her own words, one heck of a time cutting her way out. Another hunting story about Fanny was the time she shot a bull caribou, and he ran out into the Moose Creek and stood there a while, and then fell down dead in the icy water. Many hunters would have left the meat in the river. Not Fanny. 
She waded out into the freezing water and tied a rope to him and pulled him in. During the summer, one of the Quigley's pet projects was their garden. Because the soil near their cabin was not fit for gardening, soil was hauled by dog team from the flats near Moose Creek. The garden was terraced with rocks so that the sun warmed the rocks during the day and they retained the heat during the night to keep the soil warm. Though Fanny was the head gardener, Jo also shared her interests and helped with the gardening. Although the growing season lasted 10 weeks, they were successful in raising rhubarb, potatoes, celery, carrots, beets, turnips, onions, lettuce, radishes, and cabbages. Because of the 24-hour sunlight, they grew very large. Fanny also grew flower gardens with a variety of flowers. Pansies were her favorite, though, and she grew them to unusually large sizes. She took note of their colors and dried them. Then she reproduced them in needlework in the exact colors nature had chosen. Not only was Fanny a good hunter, trapper, musher, gardener, and seamstress, but she was also a good cook. Preparing full course meals from what she obtained off the land other than sugar and flour. Both Fanny and Joe had many talents. Joe was a jack of all trades, a carpenter, blacksmith, scientific prospector, trapper, musher, and one of the best hunters and rifle shots in the country. He was also a very good photographer and did most of his own developing and printing. This documentation of the Quigley's life would not have been possible without the excellent photos Joe took. Joe seemed to also have a talent for getting into accidents. Joe would stay alone for weeks working at his mines. One time, Joe was working in the tunnel of a mine when it caved in. His shoulder and leg were broken, but he managed to drag himself out of the mine and crawled several feet to his cabin located close to the entrance of the mine. Joe lay in the cabin several hours unconscious. Once or twice a week, Fanny would come to the mine and pack food and supplies to Joe with her pack dogs. Joe had laid in the cabin for 24 hours before Fanny arrived and found him there. Fanny went for help to the nearest prospector camp. Every prospector in the area came to help Joe. They carried him to the landing field where pilot Joe Crossan arrived from Fairbanks and flew Quigley to the hospital. Joe spent many months in the hospital in Fairbanks before he could walk again. Years before that, Joe had his first bad accident. In 1926, Joe chartered an airplane from Fairbanks to fly him home to Kantishna. There wasn't any landing field there yet, so the pilot tried to land on a gravel bar along Moose Creek. They crashed, and Joe ended up with his nose split wide open. Fanny, who was an artist with a needle, sewed it up with a baseball stitch. Landing in Kantishna later became much safer as a landing field was constructed in 1927 and a newer one in 1941, which is still used to this very day. Both were located in the Moose Creek Valley below Quigley Ridge. They could be seen from the Quigley's home complex on Quigley Ridge. Some people even called it Fanny's Airport as adventurous bush pilots often landed there to visit Fanny.
The opening of McKinley National Park, later called Denali National Park, in 1917, brought many visitors to the area, and Fanny had her share of them. Park rangers and superintendents often visited Fanny and found it to be the highlight of their stay in the Cantitiona area. Not only did Fanny have visitors, but she did some visiting herself. She is seen here visiting at the Black Rapids Roadhouse on the Richardson Highway, a considerable distance from her home in Cantishna. In the late 30s, park buses came to Wonder Lake and then to Cantishna, and Fanny would have visitors at her cabin on Quigley Ridge. She would show them her garden, which surprised many of the tourists that such a garden could grow above timberline. Fanny was a very humorous person and liked to joke around. She is seen here joking around with some of the tourists. Her husband Joe, wanting to retire to a softer life, left in the 30s and moved to Seattle where he remarried. He revisited Alaska at age 81. Fanny continued to have visitors at her new house built in the early 40s. It was located near the airport in Moose Creek Valley. She died there in her sleep at age 73 in 1944. The house is still standing and maintained by the Park Service. You can visit the house when in Kantishna. Some people say that Fanny's new house was built for her by Johnny Boucher, the Quigley's longtime closest friend and neighbor. After Joe left, Johnny kept watch over Fanny from a distance, knowing her independent nature. He was, as were the Quigley's, a trapper, musher, prospector, and lived from the land, but he had one more talent of his own. He made a homebrew that was called Cantishna Champagne, and it was reported to be one of the best talents he had, and Fanny Quigley was known to be his very best customer. Johnny was the last living Cantishna miner. He is seen here with Bill Julian, who was the next to last miner of Cantishna. The two men are seen here in front of the old Cantishna Roadhouse, which is still standing today. It was the town hall of Cantishna. To the north of the old hall were some of the cabins of the town of Cantishna. It is the location of the present-day Cantishna Roadhouse. Perhaps the most memorable Cantishna Hills pioneer was Fanny Quigley. Fanny and Joe never had children, but her name and pioneer legend lives on today in Cantishna. The remoteness and inaccessibility brought about by Denali National Park and Preserve Preservation Policies maintains the wilderness experience that gives us all a taste of what pioneer life might have been like in the Cantishna Hills.